Now, ladies and gentlemen, quickly to our main event, because there's a lot to cover today. Dr. Jonathan Shanza, Senior Vice President for Research at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, where he oversees work on the organization's experts and scholars. Jonathan previously worked as a terrorism finance analyst as, at the US Department of Treasury, where he played an integral role in the designation of numerous terror, terrorist financiers. He has held previous think tank research positions at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and the Middle East Forum. Jonathan has written hundreds of articles on the Middle East, along with more than a dozen monographs and chapters for edi edited volumes. His new book, which is the subject for today's webinar, Gaza Conflict 2021, Hamas, Israel, and 11 Days of War, challenges and corrects some, the, some of the wildly inaccurate news reported during the conflict. It is the first book published on the war. Jonathan also testifies often before Congress and publishes widely in the American and international media. He has appeared on American television channels such as Fox News and CNN, and Arabic language television channels such, Al, uh, such as Al Arabia and Al Jazeera. Now, importantly, Dr. Shanza also testifies in front of Australian parliamentary committees, including the recent inquiry on the terror listing of Hezbollah by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited to announce that just over an hour ago, Karen Andrews, the Minister of Home Affairs, has taken on board the recommendation of this committee to list the entirety of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. This is a welcome step and AJAC thanks the government, the members of the Joint Committee and Dr. Shanza and others for finally achieving this very just result. I'll also add that our own Colin Rubenstein and Naomi Levine provided both written and oral submissions to the inquiry and should be recognized for their efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon's topic is Gaza conflict 2021, Hamas, Israel and 11 days of war. It is now my pleasure to hand over to Ajax Executive Director, Dr. Colin Rubenstein to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Joel. Welcome everybody and a particularly warm welcome to a very distinguished uh, guest of honor and good friend, Dr. Jonathan Shanza uh, from FDD, that illustrious think tank. And with his uh, background in, uh, as a terrorism finance analyst at the US Department of Treasury, Jonathan has uh, become a prolific author and commentator uh, of great standing. And we're very privileged to have him on this uh, auspicious occasion and particularly to talk about his newly published book on the Gaza conflict 2021, the first one to come out uh, on, that, uh, on that conflict. And uh, just a, a note, it's an auspicious day because as Joel has just said, we have the very welcome announcement uh, from the Minister for Home Affairs, Karen Andrew, Andrews on behalf of the government about uh, accepting the recommendation of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security to prescribe the entirety of Hezbollah, which brings Australia into line with so many of our allies. This is something we've called for for many years, and uh, it's very gratifying that the, the government's come to that decision. We had uh, we gave evidence, other uh, friends, uh, Dr. Matt Levitt gave evidence to that committee. And similarly, uh, Jonathan Sands uh, did us a great, uh, a great favor in providing evidence to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security looking into prescribing the entirety of Hamas. And uh, I'm sure in the near future uh, that the unanimous recommendation of the Joint Committee to prescribe all of Hamas is something uh, that the government and the minister will hopefully look favorably on and act on in the near future as well. So this is an important occasion. And I, I, should, list, I should mention also that uh, we welcome the decision of, of uh, Minister Andrews today to list the neo-Nazi organization, the base as a terrorist organization for the first time uh, as well. So uh, this is a very timely webinar because uh, the, the Gaza conflict and the aftermath is certainly uh, well with us, still with us. And there's been widespread uh, misinformation about the war and uh, Jonathan's book uh, in part is designed uh, to correct that misinformation. Uh, he, he said, I think, and men in Australia said, depending on the media they're watching, uh, that there, there are two different wars, the one that was covered in some Western media and the, one, and the war that actually happened. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that there's, uh, there was a critical role uh, of 
of Hamas in triggering that war. And uh, no doubt whatsoever that there's even a more sinister role of Iran uh, behind Hezbollah in prodding and arming and being involved in encouraging Hezbollah uh, to open fire in the way that they did, uh, launching over 4,000 rockets and missiles from civilian locations directed at Israeli citizens uh, and uh, perpetrating in the course of doing that a double war crime. So uh, the ongoing role of Hamas in this conflict uh, and, and the role of uh, Iran across the region is one of the many, uh, are two of the many very profound issues uh, that not only affecting Israel, the Palestinians, but the broader Middle East. And with uh, a resumption of talks uh, due early next week, on Monday, I believe, concerning uh, the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, um, taking place in Vienna, whether the US is going to hold firm uh, on that issue or perhaps make undue concessions to Iran and turbocharge Iran and the activities of its proxies, including Hezbollah, is something here and now and on which we're going to expect uh, insightful comment uh, from Jonathan and we're certainly going to address a lot of the questions about these issues and many more uh, to Jonathan. He's been a guest of AJAC in Australia. We hope to have him again um, in the future. And again, I want to uh, thank him for the efforts that he's made to sensitize our political uh, community to the problems associated with organizations like Hamas in particular and a range of other terrorist organizations. Uh, we've seen Hamas perpetrating terror um, in, in recent days in Jerusalem and elsewhere. We've also hopefully uh, seen the United Kingdom government announce it intends to ban all of, Haz of Hamas just last week. So uh, things are moving and uh, who better than to throw more light on these wicked questions than our guest of honor today, Dr. Jonathan Shanza, addressing his new book on the Gaza conflict 2021. Jonathan, over to you. All right, Colin, thank you so much. And, and thank you, Joel. And Thank you to Ajak for, for uh, indulging me uh, tonight to, uh, to come on and, and to talk about my new book. As Colin mentioned, it is, uh, as far as I know, the, the, the first and only book uh, right now on the topic. And that was really actually the goal. Um, I watched the conflict in real time um, in actually both Hebrew and, and, and sometimes in Arabic, uh, certainly in English, watching the American channels, watching the international coverage as well. Um, it was the first time I was really able to do that thanks to smartphone and smart TV technology. It really gave me kind of a 360 view of the conflict, but I walked away feeling not so much enlightened, but more frustrated. Um, as, as Colin mentioned, it did feel like um, that it, it was almost as if the West was covering an entirely different conflict than the Israeli media and even the Arabic media for that matter. We saw very different coverage. Um, and, and really, I would say it was more vitriolic in the West than it was even on channels like Al Arabiya, which, which shocked me at the time. And so when, um, when it was all done, you know, my initial thinking was that I needed to write about this. And what, what started with a, a short uh, essay really uh, turned into eight days of, ma of marathon writing. Um, and um, I was looking basically at a 120 page draft of the book uh, after eight days, at which point I traveled to Israel. Um, I had an opportunity to sit with a number of senior Israeli officials, decision makers uh, across the entire Israeli bureaucracy. Uh, probably a highlight of that was actually meeting with Eliezer Toledano, the uh, general that was in charge of the Southern Front during the war itself, and getting a chance to talk to him just months after the conflict had ended. I should just note par parenthetically that when I went to Israel, I arrived and uh, it was like I had arrived in another world. Um, nobody was wearing a mask. Everybody was talking about how Israel had defeated COVID. Um, 10 days later, I found myself walking around with a mask on um, and looking uh, bewilderedly at uh, the rest of the country that was beginning to enter into its next phase of lockdown. Of course, the Israelis um, gave us a sneak peek of what Delta would do to the rest of the world. I was very fortunate to be able to have those meetings when I did. Um, and I returned 
to the United States, finished editing the book. And we decided to publish this not through a private publishing house, but to do it through FDD. And the idea was that we'd be able to get it out more quickly so that we could begin to set the edge, so to speak, with the narrative surrounding this conflict because of everything that was gotten wrong. Now, I'll just say just maybe one last note about the background here. I don't like to use the term fake news. Um, I don't even like to talk about media bias. What I will talk about today are the choices that the media made in its coverage of the war and how I think it clouded the view of the war here in the West and, and I think continues to cloud the view of Israel in the way that it does battle and quite frankly also the Palestinians in the way that they do battle and the Iranians in particular, uh, given the fact that they wield these um, proxy groups, Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, uh, specifically in their war against the Jewish state. So with that, let me dive in. What I'm going to do is I am going to um, start off with dates. I'll give you a date and an event that happened on that date, explain where things went awry in the coverage, and then perhaps a lesson or two after each one of those. I'll go through maybe four or five of those moments during the conflict and wrap up at which point I'll be very happy to take any questions that you may have. So we'll start with May 10th. This is the first day of the war. Um, war has just broken out and Gaza-based fighters are firing rockets at Jerusalem. Now, just remember, Gaza Strip is 50 miles away from Jerusalem. Hamas is saying that they're fighting on behalf of Muslims and Palestinians and fighting on behalf of the holy city of Jerusalem. Reporters here in America and indeed around the world were at the time pointing to a real estate dispute in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of Jerusalem. Israel, they said, was about to evict some local Arab residents. And this is the reason, you can still see this go back and take a look at the reporting from that time. They're gonna say this was the reason for the violence. First of all, let's just get one thing out of the way here. And that is that weapons cause violence, not real estate disputes. Uh, this real estate dispute was something that went back roughly a century. This uh, stemmed from the fact that there were Jews that bought homes in pre-mandatory Palestine, um, and then they uh, were ultimately evicted from their homes during the 1948-49 War of Independence, where Jordan took over East Jerusalem, dare I say, occupied it. Then after the Israelis retook that territory, the Jews went back and tried to sue for the land that was once theirs. Um, this was a dispute that wound its way through the Israeli court system, and there was a judgment coming due. I don't believe that the fact that the court system, a legitimate court system, was ruling on this case was the cause of the war. I would say more specifically, there were other causes. One was that Hamas had clearly prepared well in advance for the conflict. There were large numbers of simultaneous salvos that were prepared long in advance that Hamas began to fire off some, sometimes more than 100 rockets at any given time. But the other thing that was really missed, and this tracks back to some of the research that I have in the new book, as well as research that I've uh, published in previous books, and that is that there is a conflict that is taking place to this day between the two primary Palestinian factions, Hamas and Fatah. The two of them in the wake of the Abraham Accords had decided that they were going to try to bury the hatchet. Recall that these two factions had been engaged in open warfare in 2007. That was the war that enabled Hamas to conquer the Gaza Strip by force, killing more than 130 Palestinians in the process, wounding hundreds more um, in, in what was widely described as a brutal internecine conflict. Um, the two of them, after the um, Abraham Accords were signed, realized that they were losing the narrative within the Arab world, that they needed to come together and um, declare unity, hold elections, and get back to perhaps the goal of uh, Palestinian state building. And um, for a time, the Biden administration gave a green light to these elections. The Trump administration didn't even weigh in on them. But after Biden came in in January, there was a decision to move forward. In fact, I heard from one senior Biden administration official that, you know, far be it from the United States to tell anyone who could take part in any election, given that our system here was indeed very flawed, as evidenced by the January 6th events here in Washington, D.C. But what was ignored was the fact that there are laws in the books. In fact, some helped to be put in place by a guy named Senator Joe Biden 
that would have cut off all American funding to the Palestinian Authority if Hamas were to win seats. And in fact, there would be a full-blown political and economic crisis were Hamas to win or even to gain a plurality of seats within the, par the Palestinian parliament. And so uh, ultimately, cooler heads prevailed. The Palestinian Authority announced that it was no longer going to hold those elections. And Hamas found itself on the outside looking in. And it was then, I believe, that Hamas realized that if it wanted to try to win the hearts and minds of the Palestinian people, it would need to begin a war with Israel. It was a very calculated decision on their part that if they wanted to win that narrative, that they needed to begin to fire rockets and purport to defend uh, the Jerusalem, to, to defend the Al-Aqsa Mosque, to defend the Palestinian people against what was seen as Israeli usurpation. So the Sheikh Jarrah thing was a ruse at the end of the day, but it wasn't the first time we've seen something like this. And um, you can recall back in the year 2000, uh, when Ariel Sharon walked on the Temple Mount, that was the single moment that was blamed for the Second Intifada. Um, there was also the fact that Jews brought some religious articles down to the uh, Western Wall compound back in 1929. And that was the moment, they said, that triggered uh, the first riots, the true uh, first true round of violence between Arabs and Israelis, even back then. And I think that that leads us to a lesson here. And that is that one, um, rarely, if ever, is there a single thing that prompts these conflicts. Apart from organized Palestinian aggression, that is usually what prompts these wars. But we often find that Israel is blamed for doing one thing, whatever that one thing is. And I think the media fell for that once again. Um, the other thing that I'll just note is that all politics are, in fact, still local. Um, and the media largely ignored the intra-Palestinian dynamic. And this is something that coverage, I think, is often guilty of here in the US, but I think across the West, across the world, people don't look at the internal Palestinian dynamics that often contribute uh, to real tension in the region and sometimes to war itself. So that those are the first couple of lessons. I'll move to um, the second day of the conflict, that was May 11th. And it was on that day I was watching um, Channel 11, which is, uh, you know, I guess the, the primary news channel in Israel. And um, I'm watching my TV screen. It's nighttime in Israel. And the, the video that I watched on repeat was of fireballs reaching high into the air in the town of Ashkelon. Now, Ashkelon, you may know, is the, is the city that is just north of the Gaza Strip. If you, if, you, if, you, if you stand on the hills overlooking Gaza in southern Israel, you can literally see where the Gaza Strip ends and where Ashkelon begins. It's remarkable how close the two are. And Ashkelon has the misfortune of having a uh, significant gas pipeline that is connected to much of the rest of the world. It's a vital pipeline for Israel. And what I was watching that night was explosions that were taking place at that pipeline. And the video was jarring. Israelis were watching in horror for hours. And my immediate thought was that perhaps Hamas had been able to fire a drone or some kind of an advanced guided munition. But as it turns out, it was a lucky strike. It was a mortar, not even a rocket that was able to hit a large gas container. It's actually uh, rented out by the United Arab Emirates. Um, and it was connected to the Ashkelon pipeline. Now, Iron Dome is able to stop rockets. Iron Dome, of course, is that remarkable defense system that Israel uh, trotted out uh, roughly, uh, I guess, uh, seven or eight years ago. And it has worked overtime to protect Israelis and, and in fact, to protect Arabs and even sometimes uh, 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 Gazans inside the Gaza Strip as it shoots down rockets that are heading for population centers. Um, but here's the problem with Iron Dome, despite its success, and we've seen something like 90% success, and it's cut down on huge numbers of casualties. But mortars cannot be stopped by the system, and mortars can fly for up to eight kilometers. This one that hit the Ashkelon pipeline flew maybe six kilometers, possibly less than that. And the result was one of the more devastating attacks in recent memory. Israel still actually has a gag order on this particular strike. And, um, and I don't believe it's been lifted based on the conversations that I've had with Israeli journalists. And that leads me to lesson number two uh, that we can draw from the book. And that is that Hamas is able to cause great destruction. Israel's defenses make that less likely. And in fact, you often see the media pointing to the disparity 
in um, casualties between Israel and Hamas, uh, you know, purportedly to point out that the Israelis are the aggressor. Of course, that's not the case. They just have better technology. But the fact remains is that these rockets are not harmless. They are not firecrackers, as some Hamas apologists will uh, will posit. They are deadly weapons, and um, and Iron Dome often masks Hamas's intent. Hamas aspires to mass casualty attacks. They aspire to war crimes. Israel prevents them repeatedly. During the most recent war, we had more than 4,000 projectiles that were counted being fired into Israeli territory. Israel stopped most of them, but they weren't able to stop this one in Ashkelon, and you could see the, um, the price that was paid. Now, I'll move on to May 13th, um, and this was, I think, the perhaps the pivotal moment in the conflict itself, and that was that the IDF tweeted in both Hebrew and English that it had just put assets on the ground in the Gaza Strip. Um, from all indications, Israel had just launched a ground invasion. And so after that, we saw the Wall Street Journal and America, uh, Agents France Press and um, other American outlets running the story that Israel had invaded. But here's the thing, I ran in, I was actually outside that day, it was a beautiful May spring day here in, in Washington and I was outside actually helping my wife build a garden, um, taking a, an hour break from a long day. And I saw the tweet and I ran inside, turn on the TV. And, and what I saw was actually amazing. I'll, you know, I had, uh, I look, uh, I look on my screen and there are these Israeli journalists who are literally looking at their phone, holding the microphone and saying, none of my sources can confirm that there are troops on the ground. And in fact, look behind me. I cannot see any uh, Israeli forces going in. Something is not right. My sources cannot confirm. And so there was great confusion, um, but they stuck their ground. The Israeli reporters would not corroborate the story. And as it turns out, Hamas may have been the intended audience of those tweets and of some other messages that came out of um, the IDF spokesman's office. Because what happened was is that Hamas flooded what was known as their metro system of underground tunnels, this was a tunnel labyrinth that Hamas had created over many years, spending tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, diverting assets um, and key building materials that had been donated to the Gaza Strip for humanitarian purposes. And the goal for doing all of this was to create tunnels that would help Hamas kill or kidnap as many Israeli soldiers as possible. Israel was ready for it. Their intelligence was good. And it appeared that the Israelis had carried out a successful information operation, whether it was through Twitter or perhaps even through the American outlets that ran the story. Although it's interesting, the Israelis still say to this day that they did not intend to mislead the West and that in fact Israel actually or Hamas actually likes to watch the Israeli press to get their intel because they're better reporters. Which, you know, I, I mean, I'll get to that in a minute, but, you know, Israel basically took this opportunity to bomb the tunnels and to kill dozens of Iranian trained commando fighters, and it was a major victory. The upshot, though, was that uh, journalists here and around the world were furious. They blamed Israel for misleading them. But in my view, they only had themselves to blame. And that, that really leads me to, to, the, to the next lesson here, and that is that international journalists need to watch what Israeli reporters are tracking. This is a very serious group of reporters for anybody that tracks the Israeli press, particularly Israeli press in Hebrew. These are not Zionist propagandists. These are not people who are out there trying to promote um, Israel as the, the sort of uh, perfect country that doesn't make mistakes. They're out there trying to play gotcha with whoever is in, in the prime minister's chair. They don't care. They want the story. But what is amazing is that uh, American reporters ignore uh, what the Israeli uh, press is running with. It appears that American reporters, but also international reporters, foreign reporters, have their own agenda, that they want to run stories about the Palestinians, they want to run stories about the disparity in the strength of the Israeli army versus Hamas. And um, I think the lesson is that foreign reporters must track what local reporters are watching. And if they do, they actually can prevent some of the mistakes that were made during those, this most recent conflict, when they blame the Israelis for misleading them, what I continue to say is they could have just turned on the Israeli press, assuming they understood Hebrew, and they would have seen that the reporting that they were about to release 
was wrong. So ignoring the Israeli press comes with great risk. Maybe another lesson and aside is that maybe it's better to win a war than to be loved by the media. Um, <laughs> one can be repaired, the other one is about survival and perhaps the Israelis, if they did try to mislead, it may have been for the right reasons. Um, I'll get to, I'll, I'll fast forward to near the end of the war. Um, we'll go to May 19th. So for eight, almost nine days, President Biden had Israel's back. He never wavered, not when Israel took out the metro system, not when it accidentally struck civilians, which by the way happens of course in every war. He defended Israel when it destroyed the Al Jala Tower, which is that large building in the Gaza Strip, which was housing uh, this uh, office that was trying to jam the Iron Dome missile defense system. Um, and he re repeatedly stated that Israel had every right to defend itself. And, you know, full credit to groups like AJAC, I think, for doing the same with other leaders, uh, leadership around the world, certainly in Australia. Um, but then on May 19th, something very strange happened. The White House leaked a story to reporters saying that Biden was getting tough on Israel. He reportedly told then Prime Minister Netanyahu that he was, quote, done kidding around, end quote. It looked like things had grown tense between Israel and its most important ally here in the United States. But the fact is, is that they actually weren't tense. And this was, I think, probably a real eye opener for me because I was watching uh, the press uh, out of the Middle East. And I saw that on May 18th, the day before, it was announced that Egypt had brokered a ceasefire. It was going into effect in 48 hours. And my interpretation of those events that came after was that Biden looked at this as an opportunity to talk tough, to signal to what is commonly known here as the squad. This is the group of progressive lawmakers. Um, I would probably, I think a better term for them would be the Hamas caucus. They often support Israel's enemies. They support uh, Iran's proxies, um, as, even as they wage war against Israel. And so Biden had an opportunity to talk tough with the knowledge that Israel had actually completed its war. You could see that Israel had struck almost all of its intended targets, the cadence of the rocket fire coming out of Hamas was dwindling. Uh, the cadence of the Israeli responses were dwindling. Israel had depleted its target bank, as it's known. And most people don't realize this, but many of the, of the targets that Israel strikes during the course of any different conflict, these are pre-approved targets based on intelligence that the Israelis gather over the course of months, if not years. Remember, it was seven years between the 2014 war and this one. So the Israelis had a lot of time to collect those targets and they were depleted. And basically that meant that Israel had achieved all, its, all of its objectives and that was the moment that Biden began to message to the hard left of his party. And these are, of course, just a small number of uh, anti-Israel uh, legislators who want to defund Israel or deprive it of some of its defensive weapons. And we've seen some of that come out into the public debate in Congress. But this small and vociferous element of the party is not significant enough to listen to during the bulk of the conflict from Biden's perspective, only at the end. And so Biden placated them in the last 48 hours of the conflict. It looked like things were tense between Israel and the United States, but they weren't. Uh, those last two days of messaging were for domestic consumption only in my assessment. And so the lesson there is that despite some of the odd optics, US-Israel relations are, are actually stronger than they appear, but there is a, a footnote to that. And that is that the Biden administration, the center of the Democratic Party, still does appear to want to signal uh, to the hard left, to the Hamas caucus, if you will, um, and that there is uh, at least a political need or perceived political need to engage with these people, which I think is a mistake. They are the fringe and they should remain that way. Now, um, let's skip to the end here and, and I'll just say, that the last date had nothing to do with the war itself. That date is November 23rd here in the United States, that's today. Um, it's a crucial moment for the US-Israel relationship every day of course is. And I think you know most people here don't forget that, that every day has required Israel's advocates to um, engage in 
uh, careful effort to ensure that the U.S.-Israel relationship continues to grow and that Israel Israel can benefit the United States and the United States can benefit Israel. And I would say that in, in Australia, you have a similar uh, challenge. And I believe that is, in fact, the mission of AJAC is to make sure that U.S.-Australian relations continue to grow and thrive. Right now, the main threat to Israel um, and perhaps the, the main threat to those relations is Iran. Um, our administration here continues to pursue a return to the Iran nuclear deal. And I know that that's something that your government is watching as well. Um, this is, of course, extremely dangerous. Don't believe for a second that Iran will curb its nuclear amb ambitions. It's made it very clear over the years that it has not. Uh, but also don't forget that uh, the international community is looking to remove its sanctions on Iran in exchange for a return to this flawed nuclear deal. That means the cash will flow to the regime. And that cash will be used to buy more weapons for Hamas, because that is what happens when Iran has more money. It funds its proxies. And we can say this without a doubt. And so that means more aerial drones, more underwater drones, more tunnels, more missiles, more rockets, more guns, more commandos. And so we need to, I think, uh, repeat this emphatically and often. It's not stated enough in the media. In fact, I would say that this narrative was missing throughout the conflict, and that is that Iran is the primary patron of Hamas. There are others, Qatar, Turkey, Malaysia, these are other countries that have supported Hamas, continue to support Hamas, but somehow Iran's significant patronage of Hamas to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars dating back to the late 1980s, early 1990s, the training that we've seen the Iranians provide Hamas in places like Sudan and Syria went unnoticed. The fact that Iran helped Hamas wage war during the first intifada, during the campaign of suicide bombings, during the Oslo period of the 1990s, during the second intifada from 2000 to 2005, and the four other wars that have taken place out of the Gaza Strip, 2009, 2012, 2014, and again in 2021, they all track back to the training and arming and funding of Hamas by the Islamic Republic. And so what people are ignoring now is that if the world returns to the Iran nuclear deal and the world provides Iran with billions of dollars in cash and other financial incentives, the international community will effectively be funding both sides of the, uh, of the fifth Gaza war, of the next war out of the Gaza Strip. Before, I would say it was somewhat theoretical. Back in 2014, there was no proof that uh, Iran was sending on the benefits of the JPOA, the interim nuclear deal, uh, to its proxies. Today, there is no doubt about it, and the world will be responsible for funding both sides of this. Their support of Israel, the United States in particular on the one hand, while providing assistance to uh, Iran and then indirectly to Hamas on the other. So that leads me to lesson five, and, and, and that's probably where I'll end it today, that Iran remains Israel's most deadly threat. Um, I believe that it is the responsible thing to fight all efforts to strengthen this rogue regime. It's worth noting that this is not just an Israeli interest. And Iran is an avowed enemy of the US-led world order, and of course, that means that's the order that the entire world has been built on for the last 76 years that has contributed to incredible advances in technology and prosperity and democracy. And so preventing Iran from going nuclear and getting a financial windfall through questionable, questionable diplomacy, it's certainly a core American interest. I believe it's an Australian one. I believe it's a global interest as well. And so these are just a couple of, of moments that I describe in the book. Um, I will admit that uh, writing the book was exhausting, um, to, to put it mildly. We went from ceasefire to bookshelf in 166 days. I'm not sure if that's a record, but certainly it was a record for me. And uh, again, my goal is to help uh, try to inform what will be a debate about this conflict. Um, it's coming soon. The, uh, the, the next books will be out in the coming months certainly at some point in 2022. And my goal is really to begin to address some of the gaping holes. Again, I don't wanna call it fake news. I don't even wanna call it bias. I think there were major holes in the way that this war was described. And my goal today 
and in the book itself was to begin to set the record straight. So I thank you guys at Ajac and Colin and Joel and everyone else. I appreciate very much the opportunity to chat. Wish I could be with you in person. We'll have to wait, I guess, a couple of months for that at, 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 at minimum. Uh, but certainly I look forward to Q&A and, and continuing the conversation. So thank you again. Thank you very much for that, Jonathan. What a wonderful presentation, ladies and gentlemen. We are now heading into our question and answer session. You can use the reaction button in your Zoom screen. You can tab, hit the reaction tab down the bottom and use the raised hand feature, which will provide me with a silent notification of your intention to ask a question. I'll now hand over to Dr. Ron Porat for the first question. Uh, thank you, uh, Joe, and thank you, Jonathan, for that uh, fascinating uh, presentation. I'm looking forward to read the book or to reading the book. Uh, it's been six months since that war has ended. Uh, how would you characterize the uh, situation now? And did the war change fundamentally the relationship between Hamas and Israel? Uh, all great questions. I mean, look, what I would say, first of all, is Hamas emerged stronger um, uh, as a result of the war. It certainly took a beating. Um, uh, militarily, but it emerged stronger politically. Um, it's standing among the Palestinians, despite the fact that it wasn't able to take part in those elections, it still emerged as the actor that uh, purportedly defended the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, defended the Palestinians, defended Islam, if you will. Um, and um, there is an effort now underway by the Israeli government, as well as uh, the American government primarily to try to strengthen the Palestinian Authority. There is this, you know, balance that takes place between the West Bank government and the Gaza government. And right now there is a real effort to try to make the Palestinian Authority look stronger um, and more competent as a result of this war. The Israelis have bought into it. I think it really is the Biden administration leading this effort. And I would actually argue that uh, right now the concerted push for the U.S. consulate to be reopened in East Jerusalem is driven by this desire to strengthen the PA at the expense of Hamas. Of course, the Israelis are not very happy about that um, and they're pushing back on it significantly and I suspect they will continue uh, to push back on it. Um, in, you know, in terms of the um, current situation, I would just say that even in the last 24, 36 hours, we have seen signs that Hamas is at it again. Um, you know, somebody asked me earlier today on a TV show uh, about Hamas's arsenal in the Gaza Strip. I would actually argue that when they expended 4,000 rockets, it was probably about one fourth of their total arsenal. So they're ready to go to war again tomorrow if they see the need. But in the meantime, what the Israelis have just divulged is that there is a significant network of Hamas operatives in the West Bank. This is bad news for stability in that part of the world because Hamas will look to topple the PA. That's always been the goal ever since Hamas waged that war back in 2007 to take over the Gaza Strip. They wanted to take over both. And um, what we've now seen is that there are um, there is a network of cells operating inside the West Bank. The Israelis have broken up some of it um, but actually, the remarkable thing about it is that a lot of it is directed not by Iran, which, of course, I still believe represents the primary driver of the military activity, particularly out of the Gaza Strip. But the cells that were disrupted uh, over the last 36 hours or so, they actually had their roots in the, in the government of Turkey. Um, the, the government of Recep Tayyip Erdogan is actually the sponsor of significant Hamas activity. And the guy that actually led this cell that was disrupted, his name is Salah Harori. You may remember his name from the 2014 conflict. He was the guy who planned and financed and ultimately helped to execute that triple homicide of those three teens back in 2014. That was one of the precipitating events that led to the 2014 war. So the Turks are still at it. The Iranians are still at it. Hamas is still at it. And I think that just goes to show that there are no per permanent victories for Israel in this in this conflict. There are permanent battles. Thank you for that, Jonathan. We'll now hand over to Ajax Dr. Svi Fleischer. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, wonderful presentation as always. Um, 
could I ask about, I mean, you're, you're, you're taking it as a, your presentation sort of makes, takes it for granted um, that another conflict is inevitable. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts of there, any way not to make it inevitable. If you had Bennett and Biden in a room and said, and they asked you, Jonathan, based on your expertise in this area, what can we do to prevent another Israel-Hamas conflict? What could we do? What, what, would, what, what should we do? What would you say to them? Well, so it's a great question, Spi, and, and great to see you. Um, the, I would say, first of all, that the Bennett-Biden relationship is based on, you can sum it up in three letters. We love acronyms in Washington. It's ABB. Uh, anybody but Bibi. Um, that is the core of their relationship right now. Bennett doesn't want Bibi to come back, nor does Biden, and they're doing everything they can to just sort of try to keep things calm and on an even keel. Um, and I would suspect that that's going to be the case for some time uh, while Bennett continues to try to stabilize that government, which is, of course, uh, a witch's brew of, of Israeli political parties, making it I think a bit perilous for the for the current prime minister, um, but there are things that I think can be done. Um, the first actually is to not enter the Iran nuclear deal. Um, if you do that, then I think the Israelis will feel a uh, that America has betrayed uh, Israel in providing Hamas's most significant military patron with billions of dollars uh, that will only go to fund this Iranian proxy. And so um, if the goal is to try to weaken Hamas, then don't give its patrons more money, period. That is a fairly simple equation. Um, the other thing would be to begin to hold the other patrons of Hamas to account. And that would be three in particular that I call out in the book. Um, one is the country of Turkey, which I just mentioned. The other one is the country of Qatar, which is a proponent of Muslim Brotherhood and Islamist groups around the region. They continue to go into, uh, into uh, Gaza and to talk about trying to provide aid. We know that their aid trickles down to Hamas, much like it comes from, from, uh, from Iran. The last one, by the way, I think is very interesting for um, maybe Ajak to take a look at, and that's Malaysia. Malaysia has become a surprisingly significant jurisdiction for Hamas activity uh, over the last several years. There have actually been a number of really interesting um, news reports coming out of there where Hamas operatives have been assassinated on the streets, purportedly by the Mossad. Um, they're working on drone warfare. They're working on stabilizing rockets. They're doing military-related research with the full knowledge of the Malaysian government. And I'll just note, by the way, that I talked about this on Twitter during the war. And um, I was attacked by a Malaysian Twitter troll army. I had tens of thousands of angry responses to my one tweet on Malaysia. Um, and I found out later that it was directed by the Malaysian government, um, that they actually instructed a troll army to go after those that supported Hamas, uh, or rather that detracted Hamas and, um, and also detracted uh, the Malaysian government. So there are, I think, some patrons to target here. Um, but the other thing that maybe the last thing is that, you know, I mentioned before about how all politics are local. Um, you know, a lot of this actually stemmed from the fact that the Biden administration was willing to allow Hamas to take part in elections and then pulled their support. And that whiplash, in my view, contributed significantly to the war. And so if what we want to do is to try to prevent things like this from happening again, it might make sense to enlist the help of countries like Egypt, which have actually done a very good job in trying to mediate. But perhaps Egypt should be tasked with the, you know, the, the sole goal of trying to bring the Palestinians back together again. Um, Hamas still can't take part in elections if it's a terrorist organization. But perhaps there is a way to figure out if there is a national dialogue that can take place, or some kind of center of gravity that can be reached that would allow for a resumption of relatively politi uh, normal political activity in the Gaza Strip. I'd like to see it. That might be a reach, but in the meantime, we could certainly go after those patrons of Hamas and make it harder for Hamas to operate. Hope that's helpful.
Uh, <clears throat> helpful as usual, Jonathan. Thank you for that. I'll now hand over to Ajax Naomi Levine. Hi, Jonathan, thank you very much for that. It was great. I've got a question also that looks ahead to what we can learn and what we can do in the future if there is sort of what seems to be another inevitable conflict. Um, you clearly put a lot of um, focus on the PR war and the fact that you want your book to come out so quickly shows how important that PR war is. What lessons do you think we have learned as supporters of Israel um, and supporters of the truth, I suppose, of how we can better prosecute um, the information side, um, if there is another conflict similar to this? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I would say, um, you know, in terms of the, the, the goal, I'm not sure that I, I, I wrote the book to try to win a PR war. I'm not sure that that's even possible. Um, my, my goal was to fill in a lot of those blanks that I felt were just missing, um, you know, really fundamental components of, of the conflict that I, I think should have been noted by the media. But one thing that I think is interesting and, and, and may, you know, may, may be worth the effort is um, I'm not sure how many journalists have truly learned about the, um, the way that Israel fights these wars. And it is actually very predictable how Israel fights these wars, um, that a lot of their strategies and tactics we've seen now across four Gaza conflicts. I can, I mean, it's funny, now having watched four of these, I can actually tell when the conflict's heating up. I can tell when it's starting to cool down. I can tell when diplomacy is is beginning to 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 make headway. I mean, you can you can actually feel the the sort of character of these wars if you watch them enough. And unfortunately, there have been plenty, right? Um, you know, it, just the explanation of the target bank. Most people don't realize that most of these, uh, you know. Um, bombs that Israel will drop on the Gaza Strip when these wars erupt. Now, this is not Israel responding out of anger. It's not. It is simply Israel executing targets, executing attacks against targets that were predetermined months, sometimes years in advance. This is not off-the-cuff anger. It's not rage, which is often the way that it's described in the international press. And I think to understand that target bank phenomenon is incredibly important. Um, the, um, the targeted nature of Israel's strikes, also incredibly important. They use PGMs, precision guided munitions, with the idea of minimizing casualties as much as possible. It's actually remarkable. We've seen here in the United States a debate about whether the United States should continue to provide PGMs to the Israelis. That is essentially an argument for an uglier war with more casualties. And it just makes you wonder what our squad, the Hamas caucus, is really looking for when they advocate for that. And by the way, also advocate for Iron, uh, Iron Dome to be depleted, right? Iron Dome, you know, people say it saves Israeli lives. Okay, it undoubtedly has saved, you know, thousands of Israeli lives. But one of the other things that is just, I don't think, widely appreciated is that because it provides with the Israelis the time and space to be able to deliberately decide what they want to do next, what it does is it cuts down on the rage of war. It actually makes it so that the Israelis are making largely you know, rational decisions during a conflict in which 4,000 projectiles are being launched at Israeli airspace. The idea that you can act strategically and surgically, and by the way, after 11 days of war with 4,000 rockets coming in from enemy territory and dropping twice or three times that on enemy targets in response, that there were only 200 casualties or 211 casualties, is an, it's, it is an astounding number. The precision with which Israel carries out these wars. Now, I'm not going to tell you that it's not a tragedy that there were civilians that were killed. Of course, it's a tragedy. I'm not going to tell you that those 200 lives is not it, 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 that it's 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 not a toll that's too high. We don't want to see any casualties. But I don't think that there is a good understanding of that precision nature of Israeli war fighting. Um, and by the way, also the intelligence that goes into this. I actually sat in the operations room in the Southern Command during that 10 day pre Delta trip that I took. And I watched how I, I, I sat in that room and I listened to the alarms going off and watched the screens. And I mean, the Israelis have invested a huge amount of money and technology not to 
only defeat Hamas, but to defeat Hamas surgically and with the fewest number of casualties possible. And I think that that is missing. Um, I don't want to see another war. I, I would much rather cover something else um, like Abraham Accords or other positive things that happen in the region. But if we're going to see a war like this erupt again, I'd like to see more emphasis on the Israeli way of war fighting, which is truly remarkable. And they have it, you know, they have it literally down to a science. They're using artificial intelligence right now to help save lives, both Israeli and uh, Gazan lives. And that just, I, I think it's just gone missing. Thank you for that, Jonathan. That was a wonderful answer. And, and ladies and gentlemen, that's just a reminder halfway through this web, well, through the webinar that this is why you need to read Jonathan's book. The link is in the chat. Uh, Hanukkah is coming up, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, click the link. Amazon will get it out to you as soon as possible. This is why the, this book is so important. Uh, now I'll hand over to our next question from uh, Oved Labelle. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for doing this. Um, you focused a lot on the local dynamics uh, when it came to the war, but how much input do you think Iran actually had uh, in the decision to start the war? Because as soon as it began, all of its regional proxies got involved rhetorically and some fairly actively. Uh, and also when it comes to Turkey, Erdogan is a strange duck, but there was recently the phone call with Natalie Bennett and then with Herzog. Do you see any normalization around the corner despite the support of Hamas? Okay, two, two really important questions. So in the book, I actually devote an entire chapter to um, a phenomenon that I, I believe I've discussed with Ajak in the past, and that is what the Israelis call the war between wars. Um, this is an ongoing um, campaign that the Israelis are waging. It's an asymmetric campaign. Um, and the, the logic of it is that basically Israel's been taking it on the chin from Iran by proxy for years. Hamas, Hezbollah, Pidge, and Iran has been using others. They fight, they fight Israel to the last Palestinian uh, or to the last Lebanese, to put it in, in sort of um, in those terms. And Israel, I think, began to realize that, especially as uh, Iran was drawing closer to that nuclear program and was also sending the precision guided munitions, which I've talked about here at AJAC. Um, before, in fact, I talked about it when I was there in person several years ago, um, the Israelis decided to um, drop the gloves, so to speak, and they began taking shots at Iran itself. They've done it through cyber. They've done it uh, on the high seas in the Persian Gulf. Um, they've assassinated key figures with the associated with the nuclear program, as well as al-Qaeda figures that are based in Iran. You name it, right? It's been going on, and certainly it's been going on in Syria, where a number of Iranian lorries and, um, and planes have been destroyed by the, uh, the Israeli Air Force. And um, it has been a source of great frustration for the Iranians. And leading up to the war, after some recent attacks by Israel, we actually saw military figures from Iran, as well as the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, issue statements that were really direct threats to Israel. Um, that Israel would pay a price and that it was miscalculating and that Israel could uh, succumb to attacks uh, by some of its proxies as well as by Iran itself. And so it certainly appeared that Iran was cheering on uh, these attacks. I should also note that Iran uh, provided uh, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad with rockets. And in fact, Pidge bragged about the rockets that were provided. Um, Hamas thanked the Iranians publicly for all of the training and the rockets that had been provided over the years, the weaponry that had been provided over the years. Uh, and again, I mentioned that, you know, with the entire evolution of Hamas from its birth in 1987, 1988 to today, uh, Iran has been there as a key patron. And so there's no question that Iran had a role. The question is, did they um, order um, Hamas to fight? I'm not sure they did. Um, did they encourage? I think so. And as I actually, I told the parliamentary committee uh, just several weeks ago, that's the way that Hamas operates. They operate by consensus with the various groupings of their leadership, Iran-based leadership, Lebanon-based leadership, Qatar-based leadership, Turkey-based leadership, local Gaza, local West Bank, and they make decisions as a group. 
Um, but often it is influenced by what the patrons ask for, what they request or what they want. And so let's not forget that. Um, as far as Turkey's concern and normalization, look, this has been something that's been on the table now off and on, um, dating back to the Mavi Marmar incident. If you remember that from, I think it was 2010, that clash on the high seas between uh, Turkish activists and the Israelis that raided that ship um, that was bound to try to break the siege of Gaza. Um, and ever since then, the Turks have really ratcheted up their support uh, for uh, terrorist groups like Hamas, um, and uh, I think revealed their true colors. The Israelis would like nothing more than to normalize. And the reason for that is that there is a lot of economic gain on the line. You know, a lot of Israelis um, travel to Turkey and vice versa, and, but more importantly, there's a lot of trade um, that Israel would like to protect. But I think it comes at a price. When Israelis buy Turkish products, what they're effectively doing is lining the pockets of Erdogan, who is then providing support to Hamas. So it's a vicious circle and one that I think the Israelis would be wise to avoid. If anything, I think that now that Israel has joined uh, CENTCOM here in the United States, it's part of the Central Command, it's officially part of the Middle East, my, my thinking is that they should be trying to put more pressure on the U.S. government to really crack down on Turkey and to make it feel not welcome in NATO. It does not belong in NATO while it is supporting groups like Hamas. That's a key point to make here. And uh, it's one that I think can be made by a lot of other Western governments, a lot of European governments, those that are aligned with the United States, they should be letting the US know how uncomfortable it is to have an outlier like Turkey inside the tent in NATO. It's not a good look. And I think it probably undermines morale. It may even undermine the mission. Thank you, Jonathan. A few more questions before we wrap up. I'll now hand over to Aaron Shapiro. Yes, hi, Jonathan. Uh, um, really interesting um, discussion. Uh, what I'd like to ask you, we know about the popular front for the liberation of Palestine and those uh, NGOs that were recently uh, banned uh, for their uh, ties to terror activity. I wanted to ask, uh, we know that there have been some uh, um, very strange relationships in, in um, Gaza be between some uh, uh, humanitarian aid and the, and the Hamas regime. And I, I wonder if you could speak a little uh, about that. Uh, is that a, is Hamas exploiting that to the extent that it, uh, other groups are? And if not, why not? And the other question is in, um, in the coverage that we saw after this war, we saw on the front page of the New York Times all the, the pictures of, of, of every Palestinian child and even some which weren't actually involved in the war but were just uh, pictures to represent them. Uh, this is really um, uh, the sort of treatment that's uh, not done for any other conflict or for any other uh, situation. And can you, uh, is Israel in a position uh, to no matter how precision their uh, their munitions are, to to be able to combat that and, and be able to continue fighting on when the uh, the discussion is is about the way Israel fights is done in such a completely different way than it is for any other country. Yeah, look, I mean, on that last point, I think the New York Times coverage was really abysmal um, during the the war and after. Uh, certainly, that front page was shocking. Um, Especially because they got a lot of the 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 um, the casualties wrong in terms, you know, they they were basically saying it was all kids. In fact, many of them were combatants um, and involved in the fighting, and so um, that was remarkable. But also, I mean, I'll just note that you know I address this in the book um, specifically the destruction of the Al Jala Tower. You remember that building where there was a Hamas office that was jamming Iron Dome. Um, the day after that, there was a very strange op-ed that appeared in the New York Times, written by a woman named Leila Al-Aryan. Um, turns out her father was Samuel Al-Aryan, who was um, ultimately brought to a U.S. court for supporting um, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Um, and she never had to note in her op-ed who her father was or um, kind of where her family had been. She worked for Al Jazeera. And didn't note, by the way, that Al Jazeera was uh, a funder, uh, or rather that uh, Al Jazeera was funded by Qatar, and Qatar is a funder of Hamas. So the, the, the gaps, the decisions uh, to publish, the decisions to omit, these are choices that were being made. Again, I think bias doesn't begin to cover it. It's really as if there was, um, you know, 
very different motivations on the part of the reporters here in terms of the coverage of this war, the politicization of it, deeply, deeply disturbing. Um, and New York Times gets a number of shout outs in my book, um, and I think deservedly so. Um, as for the PFLP, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, we've been trying to learn a bit about these six NGOs that were designated. It's created quite a storm here in the US. The Israelis have designated these six NGOs, um, but have not been able to provide a full dossier on them. And the reason for that is that um, the information about them was apparently uncovered during a trial of PFLP operatives. Currently, they're currently standing trial in Israel. And so the Israelis have made a decision not to release all of the information until the trial's over, at which point, you know, I fully expect that there will be a lot of information. What we do know is that based on available information, it's already a very nasty picture for these NGOs. What we're seeing, though, is that a lot of people are coming out and defending them, not because of their innocence. They're, they're defending them um, out of purported outrage that NGOs themselves will be designated. But of course, this is something that the United States does, the UK does. Other Western governments engage in this kind of activity where they see illicit financial activity specifically related to terrorism. It's been going on now for 20 years. There is an effort underway to, um, to designate these kinds of entities. The Israelis are not doing anything that other countries, other legitimate Western countries have not done themselves. I think the, the important thing here is that we'll have to wait to see what the evidence looks like. But I think it will be really interesting to see those that defended these NGOs, what they will have to say once the Israelis have the ability to release that information in a setting that won't interfere with their legal process. Once that happens, I hope we begin to look at the broader network of those NGOs, in particular, in particular the groups that have gone out of their way to not just defend it, but to promote their work, even after some of this information has come to light. Um, and by the way, most of them operate not so much in the Gaza Strip, more so in the West Bank. The most interesting that I interesting thing that I can tell you about the PFLP that I learned uh, in recent weeks and months is that this you know this is a Marxist Leninist organization, but it is now getting a lot of its support from Iran, from a theocratic government. And so we have this very strange uh, witch's brew of ideology, Islamism coming from the Islamic Republic, along with Marxist Leninist nationalism coming out of the West Bank. Very strange indeed. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Now I'll hand over to Colin for the final question. Thanks very much. Uh... Joel. Jonathan, uh, as expected, a brilliant uh, explanation, analysis, uh, the political ramifications of the conflict and the lessons we should be learning. And we note in particular your comments on Malaysia. Unfortunately, not a surprise to us. And it's something uh, governments in this part of the world, including our own, uh, really need to address uh, in a more concerted way. Uh, my uh, triple barrel question, very unfair at this late hour, but uh, in short, uh, precision guided missiles. You've warned us in the past uh, about the, the dangers of Iran proliferating those to its proxies. How far has that gone? How dangerous is that in the region? Uh, plan uh, B on the JCPOA. If, uh, you know, the United States accepts your advice, doesn't go back into the JCPOA, uh, what are the sort of actions uh, it could take and certainly in conjunction uh, with those that Israel uh, may be preparing? And a, and a wild one, uh, talked a lot about Hamas, but Hezbollah, as you well know, everyone knows on this call, is a very serious threat to Israel, consolidating its wherewithal in southern Lebanon. What are the prospects? What can be done to restrain it uh, uh, from being, you know, the, the right arm of Iran in terms of devastatingly potentially uh, uh, responding or attacking Israel? Okay, uh, as usual, um, Colin, great questions. Um, look, on the PGM front, um, you know, the Israelis have done a lot to attack the PGMs before they arrive in Lebanon. That explains the thousands of targets that have been hit in uh, neighboring Syria since 2014. When I came to uh, Australia, we talked quite a lot about that at the time. 
because the Israelis just had a fairly significant altercation um, in the skies over Syria resulting from exactly that kind of activity. Our understanding back then, and that was what, I guess, four or five years ago already, Colin, was that there were several dozen PGMs, precision guided munitions, that had reached the hands of Hezbollah. Today, the estimates that we hear from Israeli officials is probably more like hundreds, which is, of course, bad news. Uh, the good news is that they're still limited in nature, but just remember that one PGM can be um, guided to hit a very specific target. It can try to evade Iron Dome and other missile defense systems. And um, th this means that, you know, Hezbollah could hit, um, you know, whether it's the Kiria, the so-called uh, Pentagon of Israel in Tel Aviv, or Demona, or a chemical plant in Haifa. These are all the concerns that we have right now about Hezbollah and its PGM program. Um, skipping to your third question, while we're on the, the issue of PGMs, you know, how to weaken Hezbollah? Look, right now, um, the government of Lebanon is collapsing. Um, it, it, is, it, it is insolvent. Uh, probably, I'm, I'm going to guess, offhand, 120 to $150 billion worth of debt. There's a country of 5 million people with no exports to speak of. They are in jail, economically speaking, with no sign of parole. Um, there is no way in the current environment that anybody can salvage um, Lebanon's economy, and by the way, its political system is equally as broken. Um, and this presents opportunities as well as uh, challenges when one thinks about it. On the one hand, you have the potential for chaos to erupt, and you could look at something that would you know, be similar to Somalia on, uh, on the Mediterranean. Um, and that would be a disaster for Israel. But at the same time, if Hezbollah is even at all uh, beholden to the population of Lebanon, it needs to be extremely careful um, what it does vis-a-vis -vis Israel. If it launches a war against Israel and Israel responds by flattening um, southern Lebanon, uh, the Bekaa Valley, uh, the Dahia neighborhood where uh, Hezbollah is centrally located uh, in Beirut, uh, you're looking at potentially billions of dollars of additional damage um, and, and, a, and a war from which Lebanon may not be able to return. I think that Hezbollah knows this. And so it's a double-edged sword what's going on. They're potentially able to assume control of the country, but that's, that's maybe not exactly a, a blessing for them because the country is, is continuing to decline precipitously. And that's something to watch. Now, plan B, you know, um, there's a lot of talk about that. First, I'll just warn that there's a lot of talk about having a more modest nuclear deal, uh, the so-called less for more, or less for less, depending on who you talk to. But the idea of not um, engaging on all of the issues uh, where Iran is engaging in malign activity and pushing further and further towards uh, the normalization of its nuclear program. This is what was wrong with the first deal. Um, it was wrong. What was wrong with the interim deal? It's not getting at all the uh, at all the issues. So. Plan B should be a real deal, a good deal, a, a diplomacy effort that tackles all of Iran's malign behavior, not just the nukes, but the terrorism, the destabilization of the rest of the region. Failing that, um, you know, that's when you get to, I would say, plan C, right? And, and that's the plan you don't want, which is the military operations. And on that, look, Israel's been dusting off its plans. Uh, that it had shelved baby, uh, dating back to 2011, 2012, 2013. That was back when Ehud Barak was defense minister working with Bibi Netanyahu and the two of them were talking about the possibilities. There's cyber activity, there's kinetic activity, there's you know um, all the sort of secret operations that we're seeing in Israel's war between wars. I would expect there to be a ratcheting up of this activity. The real X factor for me is the United States, that if they ultimately see that Iran is not going to come to the table and that it is still pushing for those nukes and it is on the precipice, the question is, will the United States stand by its ally? Will the rest of the world stand by Israel in its just decision to target Iran's nuclear program when everything else has failed? And I think that is the open question right now. My hope is that the United States, Australia, Canada, UK, New Zealand, that the five eyes in particular will stand by Israel. I think there is no doubt that um, Iran would intend to use its nuclear weapons against Israel. 
either directly or as an umbrella for all of the other malign activity that we've discussed today. And um, that's something that we cannot allow. So my hope anyway, is that even as this administration pursues diplomacy at all costs, if we run out of gas on the diplomacy uh, front, that we begin to at least address Israel's defense needs in a serious way. Thank you for that, Jonathan. And thank you for a wonderful presentation tonight. On behalf of everyone at AJAC, it's good to see your face again. And we thank you so much for such a uh, insightful hour. Uh, I do want to remind the audience, the link is in your invitations as well as in the chat. Please hit the link to Amazon, purchase Jonathan's book. I'm sure it will be highly informative as you've heard uh, many important points in today's presentation. Now, that's all we have time for. Again, on behalf of Ajax, thank you to Jonathan and thank you for your efforts uh, with the uh, testimony to the Australian Parliamentary Committees as well. Uh, please be on the lookout for future invitations for AJAC Live Online. You can also re-watch or send to friends full episodes of all of our content on our YouTube page. Until next time, thank you so much for your attendance. Mm -hmm.